one of the things that you you talk about that I found fascinating is that the idea of democracy or the idea that authority should be answerable to the people below actually comes from barbarians. Hmm. That was really interesting. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, the the older traditional idea of, of the West often is told in a narrative that goes back to ancient Greece and Rome as if there was a sort of unbroken tradition. And it's very true that the West draws on some ideas from ancient Greece and from Rome. It was a big influence. But there are problems historically with that narrative. There's really, there's a big break that happens. And the West, I think, really begins with the fall of Rome. It's what happens after the empire goes. And then you get the barbarians, the Germanic tribes that come in. And they're really, they're very poor, they're primitive. But they have this enormous uh, focus on the individual and other sort of individual pride. And as a result, a sort of culture of not quite democracy, but of of freedom, of free men who sort of vote together as who should be their leader. Uh, And that culture, I think, was enormously important in in forming the West and giving it shape. I mean, not just on its own. I think also it's the interaction of that with, with Christianity which is really the form in which the traditions of Rome came into that, into that part of Europe, because Christianity and the church survived the fall of Rome. But it, I think that's a much more honest place to start the conversation about the West. And it also, it gets away from this sort of grand idea of the West as something that's sort of Roman and imperial, and gets back to the real truth. The, the adventure of the West is this poor, primitive, divided corner of Europe that is nothing like as rich, nothing like as civilized in in traditional terms as other parts of the world, like like China and and the Islamic world, but that nonetheless has this thing in it, this spark, out of which are going to come things that have never been seen before in human history. Things like experimental science, like industrial capitalism, like parliamentary democracy. There was something there something there that's about the individual. And that, that is partly, I think, mm. an inheritance out of those Germanic tribes. It's so interesting, because I've never really thought about it like that, but actually the story of the West in the way that you describe it is a story of, depending how you want to look at it, either coming from very humble beginnings or a tremendous recovery from a gigantic setback, which is the collapse of Rome. And then, you know, I remember uh, seeing um, various exhibitions here in the UK about what happened after the Romans left Britain. And the tribes that came after, uh, who hadn't directly been in contact with the Roman civilization, they, the gap between them and the Romans technologically was so vast that they thought that the buildings that the Romans had erected here, which were nothing as impressive as the ones they built actually in Rome, were the work of gods because they couldn't imagine engineering at that level. And to come from that to being the most successful civilization in the history of the world is quite remarkable, isn't it? It's quite remarkable. And I think the West, you know, it, it, it's the triumph of the small. It's the triumph of giving power to individuals. But it didn't really happen because of like a, a grand theory. It happened because when Rome fell and, and then Europe was divided, no one could exert power from above to tell people what to do. Plus you had this, this culture from below that was quite individualistic anyway. So then people were free to, to play around with ideas. There wasn't uh, enough people who could, who could quash it. Traditional civilizations, which in many ways the West isn't, are much more about stability, about power from the top, about great empires. And the problem with that is you can get to quite a high level of sophistication, but its primary virtue is stability and stasis and the people at the top keeping power. Uh, And they say no to the dangerous, crazy ideas that might take them forward. And so that's why you don't get industrialization happening elsewhere, where you don't get all the crazy inventions. You know, uh, Columbus going to the New World. Well, so the Chinese had great treasure voyages, huge, much more sophisticated fleets that went out into the world. But they weren't that interested because they thought they were more important. And it was all controlled from the imperial court. So when the imperial court said, well, we don't want to do that anymore, ban the ships, burn the ships, whatever, no one goes. In Europe, you have an independent crazy guy, Columbus, who's like, I think that we can get you know, to, to Asia by going over the ocean. And he was, he was wrong that you could do that because he thought the world was much smaller than it actually was. And you know, smart people could have told him that. But he had a crazy idea and he, he went around to different monarchs in Europe and he said, give me some money, I'll go, I'll go and do this. Some said no, but there was always someone else you could go to. And in fact, I discovered, which I didn't know, that if, if the Spanish hadn't said yes, Henry the, the Seventh, I think it was, in, in England, had said yes. He'd said yes to Columbus's brother, but by the time he got back, they'd already 
gone with Spanish money. So it's an interesting counterfactual, you know, that the English might have been the financiers of, of that voyage. But the point was, it couldn't be stopped. There's something unstoppable in the West because it's so divided and broken and competitive. And there's always another power center that you can go to. That means wild ideas sort of bubble up 